Um, I was asked to hold this session in English. I hope everyone is comfortable with that. Um, otherwise, I could also do it in German, but I think there are some non native speakers. <laughs> Great. Okay, so I, I would like to start with a short disclaimer. Um, I'm, I'm perfectly fine with using Docker and Kubernetes. These are great tools. This, I don't have any problem with them. It's the same goes for Docker Swarm, Rocket Rancher, Nomad. Just name any tool you want. Really, no kidding. Even though the title is a bit provocative. I just have one issue. I, I like to use uh, the proper tool for the job and to use it in the proper way. And, and what I mean by that, I want to explain to you. Um, say you live in Munich and you get a job offer from Berlin, which is like once across Germany. And it's a job offer which is so attractive, you just cannot turn it down, you have to accept it. And then you travel from Munich to Berlin every Sunday afternoon to get to your job. And then you work all the week in Berlin and you go back on Friday afternoon from Berlin to Munich every bloody week, once across Germany. And you do this for a year, and it's so exhausting, and, and you're, you're completely fed up with it. And after a year, the company says to you, okay, we, we see your dedication, you did this for a year now, so we've got a present for you, we offer you a plane. And you think, yes, this will make everything easier now, I get a plane, it will make the travel from Munich to Berlin so much easier, and you think, this is so great, and you can see yourself traveling just a bit of the time, and then this is you next Sunday on your way to Berlin. So why am I telling you this? I'm, I'm Michael, I work at Innovex, um, and we are a, a um, company who works for clients, and um, I'm a software developer and architect, and I always usually call myself a, a software therapist, <laughs> because it's what I more or less do. Um, I'm an AWS fanboy, which does not mean that I don't like Azure or Google Cloud Platform or whatever. I'm just a fanboy of AWS, because I like the stuff they do, and this is what I know about best. So. There are probably also ways to do stuff I do with Azure and Google. I just don't know about them, and I don't want in any way to say that they're worse. Um, I built quite a bit of waipu.tv, which is an app, which is the company is based in Munich, actually. They're called Exaring, uh, so they're our client. Um, and it's an app with which you can watch TV on your mobile and record shows and things like that. Quite a cool, quite a cool app. I will explain about it a bit more in, in, during this presentation. Um, not so much about the product itself, but the way we build it. And at the bottom you can find a link. Uh, if there's anything you want to tell me, if this is a positive or negative feedback, it's fine. I'm just looking forward to every feedback. Um, feel free to do so. Okay, so what did we build when we built this waipu.tv? As I said, it's an app with peop which people can watch TV. So we have an Android app and we do have an iOS app. Of course, in this app, you somehow, or these apps, you somehow have to log in. So there is an authentication service, which then, which then does access a user's database or a user service, which has its own database. To get people into this database, there of course has to be a registration. So there's a registration service which enters uh, new customers in the user servers and then thus in the database and there are also third-party third services involved so we do not do the billing on our own there's a service which does it for us when you want to watch TV you need something called a playout service so a service which tells you where do I get the streams where are the streams I can watch and there is a streaming backend which you can imagine is fairly complicated. Um, so there are actually satellite TV signals being encoded into different formats so that you have a low bandwidth, high bandwidth format and whatever. And this is done in the streaming backend. It's also it has got its own persistence so that you can store like which channel is encoded in which way and how to access these. Um, and when people want to watch TV, they also have to know what they want to watch. So there is an EPG, an electronic program guide, which also, again, does have its own persistence. And as I said, you can record shows. So there is a recording service, which, of course, has to access the streaming backend. And there are many more of these, as you can imagine. Right now, it's about 30 services. You can see these dotted lines. Um, the, the services between the, uh, the, the dotted lines are accessible from the public. So they are speaking in, in terms of uh, 
AWS, they are an AVPC which can be accessed from, or no, we opened, we opened the ports outside the VPC. VPC is virtual private cloud, which is more or less a subnet. Um, and at the bottom, these services are only accessible within the VPC, so they are not accessible from the outside. Um, watching TV on your smartphone, of course, is just, just a bit of fun. So there is a Chromecast app. Um, I don't know if anybody ever built a Chromecast app. It's more or less just a Chrome browser running on this tiny stick with some limitations. So this Chromecast browser uh, app just gets a URL where you can say, okay, I can access this stream at this point. And of course, there is some authentication token included so that the streaming backend knows, okay, this is this user and he is allowed to do this or she. Um, of course, there's also a web version. Right now, there are only um, ways to access the registration, authentication, and recordings. So you can see what recordings you have, and you can uh, start new recordings. But spoiler, there will be also a web version of the player so that you can access the, uh, the, the Waipu player in the browser. There's another app built for Fire TV. Um, I don't know how many people of you are familiar with Fire TV. It's more or less an Android running on it. So it's an Android app, basically, uh, which does all the things all the other apps do, like the smartphone apps, plus watching it, of course, which is more fun than watching it on a small screen. So this is what we built there. Um, you could call this a microservice architecture, or whatever you want to call it. It's uh, just that we, we built this because we wanted to build it, not because we said that all oh, microservices are cool, but there are good reasons why we did this. For example, um, Germans have a tendency to do one thing on Sunday evening, it's 2015, they sit at home and watch Tatort. I don't know why, I don't like it, <laughs> but it's, it's amazing. We can actually see load peaks. Unlike any other application, our load peak of the week is Sunday evening at 2015. It's strange, but it's like that. Like, like compared to that Thursday morning, three o'clock, it's like just some butterflies coming home watching Frauntausch on RTL 2 or whatever. And so there is no, no peak at all. Yeah? You can, so we, we know that we have load peaks on parts of our system. So the playout service is stressed a lot on Sunday evening. However, the EPG service is not that much stressed because people know that there is Tatort. Yeah? Um, and of course, we also want the registration to be fully running on Sunday evening, because some people might think, oh, there is this new app, maybe I should try it out. Maybe, what happens if I watch Tardot on these? Uh, the the, the öffentlich rechtlichen shows, so the, the, the public uh, um, stations are included in the free package. So we know that the registration has to work no matter how stressed this play out and streaming backend are. So that's why we built these completely separated. There are separate services. They are running on completely separated instances. They don't even know that the other instances exist. There is no shared space, no shared database, no whatever. And that's the reason why we built it there, this way, not just because we said, oh, microservices are cool. I've heard this a couple of times, but we'll see about this later. Okay, so how did we build this? Um, Luckily, the client has uh, some very smart technical persons in uh, responsible positions. So um, we could discuss with them, or we can today, until today, discuss with them very openly about what we do, how we want to do this. And they said, okay, we do the full buy and we go on to AWS, period. Yeah, that's what they said. The only restriction is that it has to be in Frankfurt, in Germany. Uh, the service apparently is only available in Germany because there are some ridiculous restrictions when it comes to TV shows being broadcast outside of Germany. Uh, and also, <laughs> just jump one step back, which is kind of funny. The recording backend, as you see, has, is, is, goes to the streaming backend, which has a persistence. When 10,000 people record Tatort, there are 10,000 physical copies of Tatort. You are not allowed to make one physical copy and share it among customers. It's just not allowed in, by German or European law. You have to make 10,000 or 1 million physical copies of this show. So you might guess we're talking about petabyte storage there. Yes, question please. I, I'm, I, to be honest, I'm not sure. 
if the hard link, swim link, whatever, might be a legal gray zone. I'm not sure. Uh, I was not that much involved in building uh, the streaming backend. Um, I think the requirement is actually physical copy. Yeah, so you, you might guess what, what, what fun <laughs> we sometimes have when building this app. So, um, jumping, coming back from this, but also this is stuff running in AWS. Um, and yeah, so that was the full buy in. We said AWS is, is the way to go. And we decided to use what's already there. Not build our own stuff, not build our own platform, but use the platform that is there. Because we wanted to make use of stuff other smart people have already built for us and not built the stuff on our own again. So what we used is uh, EC2, it's Elastic Cloud Computing, uh, which is basically virtual machines, which you can just spin up and shut down. RDS, Relational Database Servers, uh, so PostgreSQL, MySQL, whatever you want uh, as a service. S3 is the object store, uh, which you can also more or less mount as a file store or data system, uh, yeah, file system. Um, it's like a large Dropbox. <laughs> Dropbox, I think, also runs on S3. Uh, Elasticsearch for logging Kinesis, which is, if you know Kafka, like an event stream uh, in AWS, just hosted and managed. You don't have to take care of this. And the service, I love this name, Route 53, which is the DNS service. Anyone knows why this is called Route 53? Because of port 53, right? <laughs> I just love the name. Uh, and AWS Lambda, which are serverless functions. Um, we make heavy use of them in places where it's useful, because there are places where it isn't. And then we built our basic image. Uh, they are called AMIs, Amazon Machine Images. Uh, we currently run Ubuntu 16.04 LTS, so the latest LTS version. And we put stuff which we share into this image. So, um, if you ever heard about microservice architectures, there is this polyglot development. It's <laughs> both good and bad, as I always think. So we, we decided that our uh, common denominator is the JVM. So we have services running in Java, written in Java, and in Clojure. Um, so we put the JVM in there so that all services use the same JVM. We put Nginx in there with a, with a basic, basic configuration, and all the rest is just done in the services. So if there are any specialties, these, are, these services will do these. We fostered DevOps. This is, um, I'm always, I mean, this is the DevOps con, <laughs> apparently. So DevOps has to be somewhere in my slides. Um, however, I always argue with people what DevOps actually is. I think some people do this. I always say when you hire someone who's called DevOps engineer or even worse, build a DevOps team, you're doing it wrong, in my opinion. Uh, because DevOps is like a mindset, a culture, and not a role of a person. And we said that us, the team, we want to not just write this stuff and build this stuff, but we also want to run it. So we are in full charge of the business systems. Uh, so the streaming backend are actually some other colleagues, as I mentioned before. So our team is responsible for customer registration and authentication and these playout stuff. Um, and also we are the guys. If something isn't working in AWS, we have to take care of it. However, I think we did a good job when we built it so far my phone never rang on a weekend or something it, it so far it just works and we've been online with this product commercially for more than a year now and we started building it two and a half years ago um, sorry was there feature pressure in development or have you had the time to build it really rock solid um, the question was if, there, if we had time to build it rock solid or if there was a high feature pressure. Um, we had time to build it rock solid, yes. Um, as I said, there were some, or are still smart technical persons at the client side. Um, and they decided that they want to have a reliable, stable product uh, rather than having something just thrown onto the market which just then breaks down. Some people at the client side are from I have a strong media background, and one thing they always say, or one slogan they always uh, say is, never black on air. So our goal is to never give the customer the experience of a black screen, because they want to watch TV, so it's our highest goal to always have, to always enable people to watch TV, even if something else might fail, as long as people can watch TV, we have like 90% of the job done. And yes, they gave us time. This is, of course, something that helps. Um, but still, it was, we decided that we wanted to do this. No one told us that said, you have to operate this stuff. But we said, okay, I mean, 
do we, do we need some like special ops guys? Do we have the knowledge on our own? Can we do this? And we said, yeah, well, why not? And we have smart people around. If there's anything where we don't know how to handle it, we, we can ask them and it, it, it just, it will somehow it will work out and it did so far. An important aspect of this is using right tools for jobs uh, like Terraform, GitLab CI, we will see about this later. Prometheus, it's a, a monitoring and alerting tool. Um, and so we automated everything. Yeah, we, sometimes we, of course, sometimes you do things manually, but if you do them the second or the third time, you should think about automating them. Um, and thus you can make everything reproducible. How we did this, we will see later. Just to give you a glimpse of what we are using now, so we have like 50 plus EC2 instances managed by 25 plus auto scaling groups, which is something like when you can say if the CPU threshold in like 30 minutes goes above this and that, then spin up some new instance. Um, we hardly use this actually, um, because we know quite well our application behaves. So we found a way to just yeah, scale it, that it, it's not too expensive when idling a bit, and can still handle load peaks. Um, in AWS, just in any other cloud platform, you can play around a bit with the instance types. You have very small instances with just a bit of memory, and then you have large instances which are memory optimized and whatever. And we found for every service, we found a balance how we could do this. Um, and automation, again, here helped, of course. We monitored everything, and so we could see which service is actually too busy or too idle or whatever. We have load balancers, of course, and security groups with which you can define which service can be accessed in which way. We store about uh, more than three terabytes in S3 buckets, which are mainly images from the electronic program guide. Of course, you can imagine that people want to see images for the shows they want to watch. Um, we store about 60 million documents in Elasticsearch, which is mainly used for logging purposes. There is no production feature yet in Elasticsearch. It might come. Um, but so far it isn't. And we have more than 50 Git repositories uh, in GitLab, which we built with GitLab CI. As I said, we have more than 10 lambdas, um, quite a few databases, a number of DNS entries. We use, as I said, Java and Clojure, and of course JavaScript for the front ends. And we have some stuff around that built with Ruby, Lua, and Go. If anyone ever you've used Nginx, you know this is Lua. Um, so this, but these are just like helpers, helper scripts, automating scripts, or whatever. These are not really production. It's not really production code. Um, we have a, a service called a, it's a sidecar, which does some um, event logging, which is written in Go, which is running on every machine. And we are around 15 people working in more than five locations. And it works. <laughs> Surprisingly, it works. Um, the client even is, is uh, based all over Germany. They are a Munich-based company. However, they have people also working from Berlin, from somewhere else. I'm, me, myself, I am I'm working from Karlsruhe. Um, but there are colleagues from Innovex who work from Cologne, others are from Munich, other, one colleague is from Regensburg, and just oh, Hamburg, I almost forgot them. So everything we do is, called on, uh, is done on, on remote communication. We rely a lot on Google Hangouts, Google Meet, and Slack, of course. Um, and it actually, it works. Okay, so I mentioned Terraform earlier. Terraform is a product by HashiCorp. Uh, it's a company that also built Vagrant and Vault, um, and it's, it's always said that inca infrastructure as code, it's just like another buzzword, I, I would like to call this de declarative definition of infrastructure, where you can just say, I have these instance types, I have these load balancers, and they are defined in that way. This makes it reproducible. You can, we have, in our case, we have three environments. We have a development environment, a preview environment on which acceptance tests are made or run, and then the production environment. Terraform works in states so that you have a local state on your machine. You can play around with it and you can change things, you can rearrange things. And then when you say, okay, this is the way I want, to, want it to work, then you push it to the remote state. And this is like a shared state between developers. And there's one state for every service. So I'm not sharing this. And I think it's easily understandable. So I brought some examples um, just to give you a hint what Terraform looks like. I don't want this to be a Terraform presentation. Um, so that you can say you have a global state where you define like the very basic stuff which is shared among all uh, services. Um, say you have a suffix which in our case is ypoo.tv, 
which is of course stored in this global state so don't don't have to re um, repeat this in every uh, state for every service so they can share these you can sh uh, store them store them in s3 buckets for example you can also store them somewhere else um, and then you say, I have this remote service for my server, uh, remote state for my servers, where you just store the stuff that is uh, important for this actual service. And then, just one example I picked is you can define these security groups. So you say, I have a, an a, a ELB, which is Elastic Load Balancer. It's running in this VPC, which, as you can see, is defined in the global state. Um, so I just, just say, use this subnet, more or less. Uh, and then you can say, okay, please open incoming in for, uh, or incoming port 80 on TCP for these subnets. I think it's quite readable. It's, it's, uh, this, I like the syntax actually, so it's, it's un easily understandable. And when you have this, you can reference this. Um, as you can see up there, I don't really like using the pointer, but I, I can, let, me, let me try this. You can see this is called my service ELB, yeah, AWS Security Group, my service ELB. And you can see this exactly here, AWS Security Group, my service ELB.id. So you just define your load balancer and you reference the security group, which you define somewhere else. And also, again, you say this is running in these subnets, you have a listener on this part and you have a health check. You can say, okay, if one instance is not responding with status 200 on port 80 for three times within two minutes, I guess, uh, sometimes I have to look this up, um, then declare this instance as unhealthy and remove it from the cluster. It's all quite declarative. Same goes for uh, DNS entries. We just say, okay, this is an alias for my A record for whatever domain, my service dot something. So actually we make use, we heavy use of Terraform and so far we're completely happy with it. Yes, a question, please. You mind these? Uh, uh, the, the question was, is uh, AWS root 53 record is a keyword? Yes, it's a resource defined in Terraform. So as you can see, AWS ELB, that's the way how you define an ELB for AWS. This is the way you, how you define a root 53 record in AWS. And the, the word after this, or the part after this, is the name you give it. Uh, Terraform is not only working with AWS, you can also actually provision stuff on your local machine, on other cloud providers, or, yeah, it, it's, AWS, I guess, is the mostly used provider with Plaraform. Um, so far, we're content with that. All right, GitLab CI. I mentioned this before. How many of you guys are still using Jenkins? Oh, quite a few. <laughs> there was a question, sorry. Um, the question was how, how we set up our virtual machines. Um, in, so, as I said before, we have these basic machine images where all the, the shared stuff is in it, so the JVM, or whatever. Um, and then in Terraform, there is like a hook where you can say, um, now please run this script. Uh, which is then run during provisioning. And then, for example, if we have an instance which runs Logstash, we just more or less say a apt get install logstash with a fixed version and stuff like that. Um, so you do it in a shell script. You could also do it in another way, but we do it that way, so we run a shell script and provisioning a machine. Another question? Well, we with secrets? With secrets. Um, <laughs> not yet the way we would like to do it. We are planning on moving them to vault so that yeah, they are stored in, in, in HashiCorp vault. Um, Okay, so GitLab CI. Uh, there were quite a few people still using Jenkins. Um, I, I stopped using Jenkins a few years ago, I have to admit, before get, using GitLab CI. We used GoCD because we wanted to have proper pipelines, which had been included in GoCD, and we were also happy with GoCD. However, the other teams, like the Android guys and the iOS guys, already moved to GitLab CI, and then we said, like, having two build systems completely separated is maybe not the best idea. And then we said, okay, let, we also switch to GitLab CI. 
Um, in the beginning, <laughs> there was a pain <laughs> because they were, the, the pipelines weren't really working and, and the, the stuff they claimed did not really work out that well. However, now it does. Um, there are proper pipelines. We will see this later. Um, you can have stages, environment, variables, text, you name it. Um, and there is also an easy integration of runners. I recently learned that this is also possible with Jenkins already. Um, that you can, so that you don't have to be able to access uh, the, the runner from the server, but only the server from the runner, so that you can just add your own machine if you want to to the runners. Say there is no free runner, and then you just fire up the GitLab CI stuff on your local machine, and know this is the server, and then the build is run on your own machine. Uh, someone told me that this is also possible with Jenkins already. I, I'm not sure, so I just have to believe this. Um, so this is what it looks like. You can see this customer registration up at the top left. So this is a real uh, service of ours. Um, so you have these pipelines where you can see that they are built and there are several steps in it and you, can, you have a nice overview of how they are behaving. I sometimes find this, this word blocked misleading because blocked is not necessarily a bad thing. This just means that, you, that we stop the pipeline for reasons there is a manual interaction. So we don't want to run all this stuff Automatically, we deploy to the development system automatically and then we just stop. So deployment to preview system and to production system has to be done manually. We would actually also like to do continuous deployment at least to the preview system. The client doesn't want this. Okay, so we decided to do it that way. Um, yes, yeah, so you can see this is one of our pipelines. So first you build the stuff. Then we publish it to the local uh, uh, GitLab CI repo where the artifacts are stored, then as I said, the deploy dev stage, which is then um, deployed yeah, to the dev. So the Terraform is run on GitLab CI. Yeah, so it just gives us all this. We wrapped Terraform in make files to have the opportunity to set some environment variables, for example, which, is, which you could also do with GitLab CI built-in stuff but you could not run this locally and sometimes you just want to call Terraform stuff locally to, to set up a, a development machine or whatever. So we wrap this in make files. Um, and then you can see there is a uh, this, this, this cog where you can say deploy preview. I could then click on deploy preview and this, this particular service would be deployed to the preview system. Um, and then when the job is running, you, you, everyone using Jenkins knows if you like this, you can just see the console output and you can see how long it took and stuff like that and you can retry it. Um, of course, we do not do this manually for every service. We built tooling around this. We built a Ruby script which uses the GitLab API. Uh, then checking, okay, which services are up to date, for which service is there an update in the dev system which is not yet in preview, and then you can just say, push everything you find from dev to preview, or you can say, please update at least three services. We build our own tooling around this. This is something that GitLab CI is lacking, in my opinion. Yes, please. Yeah, the, the question was if the pipeline is also coded. Yes, it is. There are called, these are more or less YAML files, which are in every service. So every service knows the way it is deployed. It's called gitlabci.yml. Um, I don't have an example for this, um, I'm sorry. Uh, but it's, yeah, you, you define these stages and you say what to run and in which order and, and when to run it. Say, always run this for every push on develop or every branch and you can declare all this, yes. Um, I'm always, I always say that this, this, this lack of, of uh, orchestrating different services is something that is really missing in GitLab CI and I already pitched that we maybe develop some open source stuff for this so that everyone can use this. So far it's like a, a shell script, but I would like to have this in a UI that even sometimes, at some point in time, our client might be able to say, I want this to go to production and then just click a button and do it. Would be nice. We'll see what happens. And then one question I usually get asked is what about testing? Um, what we use is a man in the middle proxy. Uh, it's, called, it's called that way. So there are certain subdomains, for example, customer self care dot waipu dash dev dot net. So where you can access this in a, in a, in a dev uh, environment. 
um, and we use this combination with a uh, Chrome plugin, which has the odd name Switchy Omega. I don't know why. Um, where you can just say, okay, please now proxy the request which would usually go to the dev system for this particular service to my local machine. So sometimes, of course, you have redirects or something. Yeah? You, you just go to the authentication and this redirects you to the customer's healthcare. And then when you're developing the customer's healthcare on your local machine, you can make use of this proxy that it then redirects, or proxies, not redirects, proxies the requests to your local machine, which makes it fairly easy to just pick one service in the chain of services and work on this one. Um, and there are no containers needed for that. <laughs> so this is why, uh, so far I just don't really know where to use this. Okay. This is a picture of the whole pipeline, how this stuff works. So you're working on your local, re local repo. You say, okay, so far the stuff works for me and you push it to the GitLab repo. Everything is built automatically uh, with Gradle for Java services or lining in with the closure services. Then stuff is pushed or deployed to the dev system. And then there are tests which are also run in GitLab CI, which are both backend on UI tests. Uh, they're running automatically against the dev system. And then as you can see at, at the bottom left, there is something called, uh, where, I say, where it says manually, that's what I mentioned earlier, so the, the pipeline stops. And then we say, okay, now we want to deploy this to preview. Again, there are running tests against the preview system, which are then run automatically. And the very last step is then to say, okay, now we want to go this to production. No containers involved. Everything without containers. People usually ask me, so why didn't you use containers? I, I am not really sure why, why we should use them. I mean, did anyone so far see something where he or she could say, you have to use Docker or any other container in this case because this will make these things easier for you? If so, yeah, please. Uh, I don't know in this case, but uh, I work in a company with a web service for the clients, etc. Mm -hmm. We have JVMs with Varnish afterwards and everything. And what what problem that we had sometimes was when you deploy a new app, there was problem with the files or some file didn't copy right, or you have a problem in Varnish or whatever. And with with Docker, what we were able to do was to okay, the developer I, I'm on the ops team, so the, the developer only gives me. Uh, a Docker Compose YAML, and I run that, and that brings the, the images and start the Nginx, the shell of what the developer wants, and I don't need to have an email from the developer saying, hey, you told me that was JVM 1.7 and it's not, and, and whatever. So it has its problems, but mm -hmm. it was a nice way to go. What you mentioned, we solved by you having this basic image. So we, we never we have the same JVM version on all all, all systems, um, and we we use a lot of in German. It's I think the German phrase is a lot more uh, uh, yeah a lot better in this case. It's called gesunder Menschenverstand, which is <laughs> which is common sense in English. Uh, so <laughs> um, just that. Um, yeah, let me just go on now because what I always want to say is don't put the cart before the horse. In, in German, it's das fährt nicht von hinten auf um, There are a few things I always say which you should ask yourself. The first thing is which problem are you actually trying to solve? If this what you just said that that some people are having different uh, JVM versions which running and, and, and uh, sorry. Which inshallah the version? What that's why it was a problem. Yeah, so so the, which there are. Uh, there are problems which you, of course, can solve with containers. Absolutely. I don't say that, that there aren't. But is it actually, does it really help you to solve your problem? Like, if you do have a crappy application and put it into a container, then you have a crappy application in the container. So, I, have, I'm not, I don't make these things up. I work for 
quite a few customers apart from this project, and you often see this, that people just say, oh, we put everything into containers, now we have containers. And they, yeah, so <laughs> why? Yeah, it's what containerization is. Yeah, but, but still, how does it help you? Does, how does it help you with your application not responding fast enough to requests? Yeah, but containers. No, not containers. It's, do you have a problem with your application, not with the infrastructure? Um, and but making the, the application elastic is <laughs> much more convenient if you use uh, Kubernetes. So if you have to wire it up all by yourself, then this is a lot of infra coding. So your argument is that making a, an application elastic is easier with Kubernetes? I doubt that, to be honest. If the application is not built to be elastic, then Kubernetes will not help you. And if it's built to be elastic, you do not need Real, do not really need Kubernetes. I don't say that Kubernetes is the wrong choice. I say that you really should think about is the Kubernetes, the complexity that comes along with it, is it what I need? I would go on because I will um, reference to this a bit later. Um, so I, I always want to ask you, is, is, does it really stop you from making the same old mistakes? In some cases it will, in others it don't. Or it doesn't, sorry. Um, and as I said, do I do I maybe want to avoid the complexity I get with Kubernetes and Docker and just get going? Again, there are cases definitely in which this is the right choice using Kubernetes and stuff, but I'm not sure if this is always the case in, or at least in cases where I have seen Kubernetes being used. Yeah, and is it really this platform you want to start with? I see sometimes I see greenfield projects where they start from scratch and they start with thinking about the platform for like months and building a platform, not running a single service, and this whole platform, even after months, is not doing anything than just being an additional uh, um, uh, heater for your data center. Because it's just like doing stuff and nobody really knows. It's not really used. Um, what I mean with this is, does anybody know what a turducking is? Any Americans in here? Or it's, it will be Thanksgiving soon, I guess this week. Yeah, you will see this. So I'm a vegetarian. I'm a vegetarian. People usually don't believe me that I'm a veg vegetarian when you see these next slides. If there are any other vegetarians, please close your eyes. <laughs> so the tur in turducken is for turkey. You take a turkey, and apparently the duck in turducken is for duck, and you take a duck into which you stuff a chicken, where it just then comes from. So you take a chicken which you put into a duck which you put into a turkey. <laughs> if you know how to handle this, in the end this will look like this. Probably for some people delicious, I'm, I wouldn't really like that. Uh, however, why on earth am I, am I showing you this? I think there is quite an analogy to, to Kubernetes and Docker and stuff. Like Kubernetes and, and Docker is a cloud in the cloud. When you run Kubernetes and Docker on a cloud platform, you build your own cloud in the cloud. So you have several layers of abstraction. You have this chicken, you have the duck, and you have the turkey, and you have to really know how to do this. Like It takes an experienced person to handle this. If you would let me cook, or if you let me cook this, this or prepare this, this dish, I would not anyone. I wouldn't give this anyone to anyone to eat. I mean, it, <laughs> the result would be horrible <laughs> if I tried to prepare this dish. And you have to sure that you know how to prepare the interior first before thinking about the other layers. So if you just take a frozen chicken, put it into a frozen duck, into frozen turkey, and put it into the oven, you cannot eat this. If you prepare the filling with the chicken properly, and then put it into the duck, which is then again prepared properly, and then put it into the turkey, then it might look like this. If you just put the frozen stuff together, it will not look like this, and it will be inedible. So this is why I have this analogy. So that there will, this is a perfectly fine meal. Fine meal. There's nothing wrong with it, but you have to be sure that this is actually what you, what you want to eat and how you prepare it. So the conclusion is, in our case, we know how the interior works. We know how to prepare this chicken. We've done this for two and a half years now. We have loosely coupled surfaces. So we have these layers. They're all already there. We know which load to expect, so we know how people, many people will come for dinner. We know how many customers to expect, we know when they will be coming. We have a working pipeline, so we have an oven which is big enough for this turkey. So we have everything. Maybe we should start using Docker, Kubernetes after all, maybe. 
maybe there are cases in which it would help us. So far we didn't find any where we'd say this would make life easier for us. And this is something that I want to emphasize, that you always should think about, will it make life easier for us? If the, quest, if the answer is yes after thorough investigation, perfect, use it. The great tools. But I doubt that, in, that this is always true. So the question is, is everything great without Docker and Kubernetes? But just not using it, is everything fine with it? Um, so to make peace with people who say, please use Docker, please use your Kubernetes, I have an example where I would actually say, just use them from the start. This conversation that will now follow, I have it in my presentations for two years now. Um, and unfortunately, it's still very up to date. So there was a real conversation or real conversations I had in another project. So the manager of the client called and said, we need microservices. And we said, there, okay, cool. Why? Why do you need them? The answer was, yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> So did you talk to the dev guys and the ops guys? And the answer, surprisingly, was <laughs> And then we said, okay, so this is management-driven microservice development that might become fun. Uh, but we are not just developers, we are also like consulting people. So we said, okay, going to what, what they told us about their application and so going into the direction of microservices might actually be, the, be a good idea. It's just like using microservices as the silver bullet is just idiotic. You know, it's just wrong as using anything with, as a silver bullet, like serverless or Docker or whatever. There is no silver bullet. But in their case, it actually made sense to move to microservices. So we stayed in this project. And then I said, okay, I mean, we're like big fans of DevOps. So as I said before, in our project, we operated the VMs from our team. We said, okay, can we operate? So we were talking to the development manager. They were very strictly separated, development and ops in this company, quite a large company. So can we operate the VMs from our team, from our dev team? No, 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 the ops team does that. I said, okay, I understood. However, can we maybe move people or shift people from the ops team to the dev team so that we can share the knowledge? No. Sorry, no, not possible. So yes, okay. This becomes interesting, but I would then at least try to talk to the ops guys because they should know what we're doing. Can I talk to them? Who's the person I have to talk to? They say, nah, you cannot do this. They have their own roadmap. And then I got a bit nervous. Um, I said, okay, so there are plans and they have plans and they somehow try to match or meet somewhere in the middle. How should this work? But I can stay very persistent or be very persistent. And at some point in time, I found out who to talk to at the ops team. And I said, okay, we built this, we extracted one tiny service from this huge monolithic approach. And we watch, just want to get a, a feeling for how, how to operate microservices or tiny services because they're, so far they were always running monoliths. And we said, okay, we, we have this little proof of concept we want, want to run with you, which is two tiny VMs, like 256 megabytes of RAM, whatever. We don't need anything else. You have data centers. You have data centers spread over the country. So please just give us one machine there, one machine there, and this load balancer that we can also have fallback and whenever you can, we can, could we do this? And I said, nah, that's not the way we do it. We always run a cluster of three nodes per data center, 64 gigabytes of RAM and six CPUs each. You can have these. And they asked, but that's not what we want. We, we, we want to run tiny services, not the monoliths. We want to run small things. Wh why do you offer this? I said, okay. <laughs> that's the way you do it, if this is the only thing we could get, could we have them this, by this afternoon? I mean, it's a VM. Yeah? So after all, it's a VM. Any guesses how long, what they offered? <laughs> it was the average delivery time is eight weeks for VMs, firing up VMs. And, and we're talking about a company who has their own data centers with large machines. And they said setting up VMs would be eight weeks. And in such a scenario, I would definitely say that you can get benefits from Docker, Kubernetes, and whatever. When there are barriers between the development team and the ops team, which you just cannot tear down, as you said before, like you, you need to get an email from someone, hey, your stuff isn't working on that machine, and then you say back, oh, but it's your fault. And 
of course, these things are are made a lot easier when you use containers. Yeah, when you have a, a common denominator where you say, okay, this is the stuff we all use, and please put it into this into this container, and we guarantee you that we can run it on our environment. Perfect. Yeah, this is. These are the right tools, and also the right tools to start with right away. However, people start with these tools as well when they actually, when they are not at a point, in my opinion, where they would actually help them. The problem with this is that the people are not really talking to each other in this case. Yeah, we said, but that they have a different roadmap, and it was hard actually to find people to talk to. And in our case, with the one I described before, we are all on the same side of the rope. We are all trying to achieve the same goal. And in this case, people clearly are not. So the development said we want to develop small services which are then run on small VMs. And the ops guy said, no, nah, we, we can only operate this tall and this large stuff. So if there's one thing I would, would like you to take away, <laughs> Maybe forget all this technical stuff, it's, it's, it's all right, it's fine. Um, there's one thing I would like you to take away from this session, and this is tools will not fix your people issues. If people are not talking to each other and not you, aiming for the same goal, you can use Docker, Kubernetes, Docker Swarm, Nomad, you can use Java, you can use PHP, you can use whatever you want, it, just, it will not fix your people issues, it will address the symptoms, but not the issues. There are bigger problems than that. Um, and in all this, I've been doing this for 15 years now, and in all the cases where I've seen projects failing, it's never been the technology that failed. Technology could always be handled. It was always the people issues. It was always political issues where people said, oh no, we have to, we have to do the, like these 30 people ops department or the 30 people developers department, they, they cannot work with each other. And this is just ridiculous. Things will not work out in the end. As I said, we are working together as a team and we say we operate it, we run it, we build it, and it works, surprisingly, because we're talking to each other. Uh, and also communication is a big problem. I mean, if the communication in your team does not work, you can buy as many Slack licenses as you want. The communication will not improve. If your software development process is messed up, you can buy Jira licenses as many as you want. It will not improve. So, unfortunately, this is like, a, like a, <laughs> towards the end of my presentation, this is like a, <laughs> it's like a bad message. But I guess this is something you have to address a lot more than just the technology. Uh, technology uh, address or focus more on the people stuff. Why, why, why is there actually a need for using containers? Where if there are technical reasons, say you have a data center which is like, because from the old times you bought these huge machines because you usually bought these. There was this capex planning and you bought huge servers and you want to make use of them a lot more efficient and slice them down into tiny, tiny portions which you, on which you can run tiny services. You're perfect. Go ahead with Docker Kubernetes. It's perfect, perfect scenario. Um, but in other cases, you should focus more on, on, on the people issues. All right, so um, this is about the end of my presentation. It's one more thing I want to know. Okay, so I pressed one time too often, <laughs> so it's already there. <laughs> you know this optical illusion? Both sides, uh, lines have the same length. Anyone who doubts this, this is both lines have the same length? No? Don't believe anything just because it's written on a slide. Thank you.